UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly met with the Chinese Vice President over the weekend. Cleverly says the two sides discuss cooperation on climate change, economic ties and people-to-people -people links, but he also made plain, in his words, to China's Vice President that Britain's view, uh, on what Britain's views were on Hong Kong, Xinjiang and Taiwan. The meeting follows a major foreign policy speech from the Foreign Secretary in which he laid out Britain's approach to the rising superpower. And that policy calls for engagement with Beijing, but also a rigorous defense of British values and national security. The British High Commissioner to Canada, Susanna Goshko, joined me to discuss that UK framework. And a note, we spoke before Canada expelled that Chinese diplomat. Hi, Commissioner. It's good to see you again. Great to see you, David. This speech, in a nutshell, the Foreign Secretary laid out a British approach to China, that it's a robust and constructive engagement with Beijing on some issues alongside this steadfast defense of British national security and British values. That is a tough balancing act your country is seeking to achieve. Right, but diplomacy is all about nuance, and that's the space that we're in. Um, look, his main message was that we can't reduce China to a soundbite. It's a huge country uh, that's seen a lot of change, but has a very long history and uh, culture, and therefore our approach to it has to be one that recognises that and recognises that we need to be nuanced in our approach. It has three basic strands to it. So it's about protecting our national security, recognising that there will be some things where we need to put our own national security above anything else in the relationship. It's about aligning both with allies like Canada, but also other countries in the region. And it's about engaging China where it's in our interests to do that. The engagement part is the challenge, though, right? Because uh, Beijing doesn't play by the rules of the liberal world order as the world increasingly polarizes between democracies and autocracies. We've got arbitrary detentions, punitive trade, foreign interference, intellectual property threat, yeah. the human rights abuses. So how do you engage with a country that sort of refuses to play by the rules? Well, so uh, it's a good question. Um, first of all, uh, diplomats are all about doing complicated things like that. So, um, yes, of course. but. Look, we, we have to find a way to engage. The reality is that there is no solution to the big problems of the day, whether that's climate change or the next pandemic that doesn't involve China. And so they have to have a seat at the table. They have to be part of the conversation. But I would say, as the Foreign Secretary laid out in his speech, engagement isn't just about uh, finding sort of agreement with China on things. It's also about holding China to account where it's entered of its own free will into commitments that it's then not abiding by, whether that's the joint declaration in Hong Kong or whether that's the UN Charter or any of the other agreements. Engagement is about feeling that where China isn't abiding by its commitments, that's a conversation we can also have. What about if China is the next big problem, I guess, because the Foreign Minister, the Secret Secretary, excuse mm. me, he highlighted the, the consequences of a war with Taiwan, yeah. right? And warned against this rapid military buildup we're seeing in China, right. the lack of transparency right. around its intentions. I mean, how do you confront it if China is, in fact, the next problem because of hostilities yeah. in the South China Sea? Well, look, our position on Taiwan is, uh, is, is fixed, and that is that this is an issue that needs to be resolved peacefully by people on both sides of the straits without threat or coercion. We think that that's really important, and that's what we uh, have stated repeatedly. The impact on global trade of any kind of aggression down there would be catastrophic, as uh, Secretary Cleverly spelled out. I, I mean, his me what is the message there from the UK to China, and how do the allies, and, and you know, Canada and NATO and the rest, you know, reinforce that message to China mm -hmm. of the consequences of that when you look at how much tanker traffic goes yeah. through that area yeah. and, and just critical minerals, semiconductors, how do you reinforce yeah. that message? I mean, that's absolutely right. Distance is no protection against any conflict in the Taiwan Strait. It's the 16th largest trading economy. It's really critical to supply chains of the future, whether that's semiconductors or I think something like 70% of the chips in your smartphone right. come from Taiwan. The impact of uh, conflict there would be really catastrophic for all of us. And that includes China. And I think that's why we've just got to keep repeating this message of uh, no inevitability around conflict there and the importance of people on both sides of the straits finding a peaceful way through. Explain to me the call for transparency. What, why it was so important for, for Secretary Cleverly to make that call that China must be more transparent 
in, in its motivations in this military buildup? Yeah. You know, what is it the West is looking for there? Is it so they don't misinterpret this, yeah. start conflict? What are you looking for specifically? Yeah, I don't think there's anything too complicated about that. I think it is simply that there has been a huge military buildup. I think it's one of the largest in peacetime that we've ever seen, and it's really important for us to understand what's behind that so that there are no missteps. And so in the absence of that clarification, yeah. how do Western countries respond to that? Well, I think we just have to keep repeating this message that it's in nobody's interest to see conflict in that part of the world, that there must be a peaceful way through and that conflict there would affect us all. Trade and conflict are short and medium term mm -hmm. tensions. Climate is sort of a long term existential one. Yeah. And, and um, if you look at the amount of emissions coming out of China yeah. in the past decade, I think it is, eclipses what the UK has pumped yeah, out since the industrial age began. That's right. Can the world advance on climate without China? I, I mean, how can uh, the committed yeah. to, to dealing with uh, climate change countries move ahead yes. if China isn't on board? So I, I think China has to be on board. China has to be part of the solution on climate change. You've identified why the scale of emissions coming out of China is hugely significant, uh, largest emitters in the world, but also the largest users of energy uh, uh, ZEVs, the largest producers of solar power. Mm. And so it's a complicated picture there on climate where simultaneously there's huge amounts of emissions, but huge developments forward as well in terms of renewable energies and uptake of them. China has to be part of the conversation on this. And we've seen that, you know, where they are, it really helps. We saw, for example, uh, with COP15 in Montreal on biodiversity that China, uh, as, as the presidency of that, had a really key role to play. It's really important that China are a key part of these conversations. But I guess China can be going in two directions at the same time, right? Scaling up on solar, scaling up on EVs, and yeah. still burning coal and pumping yeah. out fossil fuel emissions at, yeah. at a catastrophic rate. So, I mean, how do you engage them on that? Like, uh, the biodiversity uh, progress, I accept that. I mean, that yeah. was hailed as a big success, despite some objections by some countries in Africa, for example. But how do you get them to abandon one path <laughs> yes. and more readily embrace embrace the other? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good question. You're right that biodiversity, uh, we have made some steps forward. A mm -hmm. framework, for example, that was put in place in Montreal that allows us really to think about how that's moving forward over the next few years. Look, on climate change, I think what we need to do is think about the positives in this to really encourage China and all of us to think about what the transition forward looks like. But we can't pretend that there is no role in the short term for some of the energies that we've relied on over the last few years, whether that's in Canada, in the UK or in China. But the future has to be a clear path to net zero within the time frame lay laid out by the UN. Overall, though, in the approach to China, do you think Western allies are aligned enough on this? I mean, the U.S. is obviously mm. very hawkish. Uh, and, mm. you know, this is this speech is a departure from, say, the David yeah. Cameron era yeah. uh, in the United Kingdom. But, you know, France uh, yeah. seeks to get tighter roles. The Germany is very much economically yeah. invested. Do you think there's enough alignment in the West in a common approach on how to deal with yeah. a rising power like China? Well, lots of countries have put out some form of an Indo-Pacific strategy over mm. the last few years, which in itself is a really interesting indication of the world changing or sort of the, this growing coalescence around the idea that we need to think differently about this part of the world. Uh, obviously, Canada put out its own strategy last year, and there were lots of points of commonality between the Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy and both this speech has set out by the Foreign Secretary and also our integrated review, which set out a holistic approach to the Indo-Pacific, uh, that piece around needing to engage, but also needing to be really clear-eyed in our engagement is a common theme that comes through. And between the UK and Canada, there's been some really interesting uh, bits of collaboration and overlap in our approaches. We've shown that on the standing up for the values piece, for example, we co-led on uh, resolutions on Xinjiang at the mm. UN Human Rights Commission, for example. But on the sort of pointier end of it, we've been engaged in military exercises together. We've done lots of things where it does show there is a lot of commonality in our approach. Okay. Hi, Commissioner. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.